Thanks. Uh, excited to be here. We've got a great group of distinguished panelists, and um, looks like a great, great showing the audience. So today's topic is uh, creating value. Uh, so focusing mostly on sort of what happens post close of an investment. Although we'll have a few more about uh, about due diligence and how to identify levers to to think about when underwriting. So I think to get it started, uh, just a quick round of of introductions. Um, so maybe we can start at the end with Keith and work our way back. Sure. Uh, Keith Sedwick, um, after about 10 years in investment banking, I uh, joined with a partner uh, also from Booth where I went to school and we uh, looked at various companies and came up with uh, one in the wine cabinet world, an accessory company, and we uh, offered the guy who's struggling about 25000 for his company and an earnout over three years and then we've since added four more companies in our space and started one other company. So built a platform of companies, consumer product focused on the wine sector. So uh, David Rhodes. So I've been um, in software development for some form or fashion for about 30 years now. Um, kind of call it my first career was in telecom and electronic trading. Wrapped that up in 2016 after having led some uh, software development teams for Chicago Trading Company. Got introduced to the search space in late 2016 through uh, Carlos at the Operand Group. Um, invested as an LP, became active in uh, tech diligence, uh, joined one board. What's a little closer? A little closer? Great. Um, uh, joined one board, uh, got introduced to Brian O'Connor at Next Gen Growth Partners, did uh, many of the same things. Uh, but got addicted to the work I was doing with one of the portfolio companies, Condata Global. Um, so I actually joined them full time as uh, as CTO earlier this year uh, because, you know, after years of electronic low latency option software development, the natural next step in one's career is uh, freight invoice auditing in uh, southern suburbs of Chicago. So. Great. I'm Mary Chowning, and uh, I uh, have had many roles in my career. I was a searcher about 20 years ago, and we did a successful roll-up with a partner. Um, I've worked in the corporate world in finance and operations in C-suite public and private companies. Uh, now my portfolio is I'm an active investor, an LP, with Foodaloofu Partners. Um, I do a little bit of consulting work primarily for search fund companies as they need it, and I sit on three boards, two private and one public. Hey there, I'm Jeremy Bacon. Uh, I am a, an investment banker turned entrepreneur. Um, been here in Chicago for the last 20 years now and started at Goldman Sachs and left Goldman in the early 2000s to start building software companies, uh, generally as a co-founder. And along the way, in addition to starting a handful, um, I sort of did, I guess I would consider them almost self-directed search funds. So I would have an idea and a platform and the, the, the majority of uh, an MVP I would find a CEO uh, to go run it for me and find them capital and help, uh, help finance the business to get it going. Uh, my day jobs today are I'm the CEO of a software company called Imagineer Technology Group, which we uh, merge slash reverse acquired at the end of 2017. Uh, through another entity that I had started, and I'm also the CEO and co-founder of a, of a business called The Forge Adventure Parks, which is a, my first non-technology focused company. We're building adventure parks uh, uh, around the country. Great. Uh, Mike Velsich, I'm a principal with K1. K1 is an enterprise software focused private equity fund in California. Um, managed two billion of assets in total, mostly North American focused, um, and all, all software. We are not a search fund, but um, as it happens, we've looked at a couple deals this year that actually have sort of been search-funded companies that, that have kind of grown up, and so um, an interesting lens on the, the industry and kind of the outcomes of the, some of these companies um, through that. But um, I think with that, we can, we can jump into a handful of questions here. So maybe, you know, I, I think a topic that comes up a lot as, you know, we're preparing for this has been when you're entering into investment with a, with a new business for you, uh, putting in new systems and processes and often asking a lot of questions. As a manager of a, of a company um, getting their feet wet, uh, what can you do to get the best information uh, out of these businesses? What are the metrics that you try to establish very quickly on a daily, weekly, monthly cadence that are most important for you to get your arms around right away? 
Um, what are some challenges you've seen and some tips and tricks to try to get that type of information quickly to help you make good decisions in real time? Um, Mary, do you have any, any thoughts on, on the topic? Well, I think the first thing you need to do is understand, you know, kind of what your technology and information platform is. You may have a lot of limitations, uh, but the first thing is a 13-week rolling cash flow because you don't want to run out of money, all right? So that's kind of your baseline operating item that you need. And then you're going to need sales data, uh, and whether it's daily, weekly, or monthly really depends on the cadence of your business. You're going to need sales data around a pipeline so that you've got visibility to what's coming. And then the other metrics that you're going to need, I would recommend that you pick three to five, no more, and figure out what's going to be meaningful to measure the progress of the company that you're running. Let me just jump in. So I, I guess I would say that I fully 100% agree. Um, the one other thing that I, um, that I often think through and try to help the team of people that we're working with post-acquisition think through is um, how do we look at and determine uh, cultural KPIs? Oftentimes when you're going through a transition period where if you're, if you're taking a founder out of the business, whether it's a direct you know, bought, sold, done, and he or she is out of the business or there's a transition period via the earn out or whatever, uh, whatever else it might be, you're inevitably going to be changing the culture of the business in some ways that are po positive, but oftentimes there's the, the potential that you'll change uh, culture negatively, and so you want obviously to to avoid that. So I've I've always found that sort of setting a cultural KPI or two um, is super helpful, and the best way to do that is not necessarily just with the C-suite um, of the company that you've acquired. It's actually getting really deep into the company early to solicit uh, true sentiment around what culture really is and what that needs to be to continue to drive success. And Jeremy, are there are there tools or metrics or what's an example of a of a cultural KPI that, that's worked for you? Yeah, so um, uh, I, I guess I don't, I'm not aware of, the, of there being any like one specific or one perfect KPI, but we, we generally look at uh, and do an evaluation of mission, vision, values of the organization. And then we typically use a methodology that has been, um, I would say, pioneered slash championed by a, a consultant named Patrick Lencioni, if any of you are familiar with his work. I'd be willing to bet more than one of you here have read some of his books. Um, but there's this notion of, you know, uh, thematic goals, defining objectives and standard operating procedures or standard operating objectives. Um, inevitably, culture fits into one, two, or three of those tiers. And so we often look at those at the sort of the, the thematic and defining objectives of the business and uh, see how the culture fits into those and then drive that into the other KPIs that are specific to operational issues. I've got, uh, I've, I felt like one of the most important things we did as a very small company was move from QuickBooks to something more robust. Uh, in our case, it was NetSuite, and we've been able to layer in transactions much easier. NetSuite, in our case, allows us to have everything all the way from inventory to all the books, all the way through to CRM, website, everything can be done. It's all in the cloud, and um, it's been e exceptional for us in terms of the power that we can draw on from them. It's, uh, Big, big. Keith, in your experience, what, what, what's like a reasonable size cutoff, or, or how would you think about it? What stage? That's I mean, we were really at, at two or three million uh, in sales at that time. We didn't really need to have it, but uh, looking back, it was it was huge in terms of being able to grow and, and grow with it. Great. Um, I, th I think another topic that's come up a few times has been as you approach due diligence. Um, what are the types of questions that, in, in your experiences or in talking with others? Uh, you have found to be the most productive questions to suss out potential deal killers. What everyone's, of course, trying to avoid is finding things out at the last minute that you would have loved to learn earlier um, and save a lot of time and effort and money. So as you think about your operating experience, uh, what are the types of questions you, 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 in retrospect, might have asked sooner or are glad you asked very soon in your diligence process? Um, so maybe we can start with, um, start with Jeremy on this one. Sure. Um I'm a big fan of the, the silly, simple question, you know, what keeps you up at night? Um, it's usually how I start and end almost every diligence meeting uh, and on often management meetings on an ongoing basis. Um, it's oftentimes you'll find that that thing changes a little bit from, from quarter to quarter, time to time, moment to moment, especially in, in, in diligence process. Um, so it, although it's super simple, I, I generally start with that. Uh, 
the thing that I always go to is integrity because when you're buying these small companies, there's really no way to know what's behind the books. You can do your homework, but in the end, if you don't trust the, the sellers, it's going to be a problem. And if things get hairy early on, they rarely get better. So usually if things go sideways at that point, um, it's easy to say, well, let's just keep hanging in there. Maybe it'll turn right, but it usually doesn't. So um, it, if, if the seller doesn't have a great reputation in the marketplace, that's going to be hard to overcome. So integrity is, is the first thing that I look at. Yeah, and I'll, I'll chime in on this one, too. It's, um, sometimes we're investing at a, a different stage, but uh, we actually did a project about a year ago. We looked back every deal that we either um, had to kill late on or, in retrospect, we all agreed we shouldn't have done. Um, and sort of asked ourselves what were the questions that you know really might have sussed that out and we, we landed on two things one is very easy and the other is a little more complex the, the easy one is um, very simple but saves a lot of time um, you can spend a lot of money doing deep dive background checks on folks that are going to be key in the business you can spend an hour doing uh, a social media search and a Google search um, around the key people in the business and um, I can't tell you how many deals we've avoided situations that um, could have taken a couple years to, to suss out. So um, very simple thing to do, saves you a lot of time later. The second one, if you're, um, particularly if you're thinking about valuation as a function of recurring revenue in a business, but I think in any, any type of business, it's important to assess really the mix of the revenue by customer. And often, in our experience at least, that has been the type of thing that even larger businesses often have a hard time really providing you is customer revenue by customer data. And so being able to sort of track that going back helps you really get to the crux of which customer relationships, which contracts we need to review and what depth for the bigger ones. If you've got some down sells, perhaps they could be um, predictors of future risk in a business. Um, and then just, you know, what kind of customer attention are you dealing with? Often that information is conveyed um, somewhat informally in your initial discussions, but at a certain point you really got to hone in. So spending the time to sort of build that revenue by customer type of uh, diligence product is, um, in our experience, been really valuable. Um, you know, I, th I think one of the other aspects of, of um, these experiences that, that have come out has been the importance of hitting the ground running um, in any deal. And so you know, people talk about 100-day, 100, 100 you know, kind of value creation plans. Everyone has their own nomenclature and the way to think about it. But in any regard, there's always a, 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 a issue of prioritization. There's often a lot to get your, your hands into. but Figuring out what comes first is uh, is really important. Um, you know, per perhaps uh, uh, Keith, you could you could start us off. Just in your experience, how do you think about the process of all the initiatives you can take mm -hmm. on? What what you do first? So um, we bought a company last year that had done 12 million uh, two or three years earlier, and had gone down to one million. So they were definitely a distressed asset. We were just basically buying the assets. Um, and we felt like we could turn it around if we just had product on the shelf. But what we also realized over the last year is that it takes a lot of work to get those customers back. Once they've been burned uh, with not having inventory and, and in a sinking ship, they, they're really hard to get back on board. So we've kind of stabilized it, but um, you know, catching a falling knife can be tricky. Uh, definitely get great value, but it's gonna be, it can definitely take some time to turn around. So that was just a little war story. So I can uh, I can touch a little bit on the the, the hundred day plan. Um, you know, as uh, as Mike said, it it is kind of a best practice. Your board's going to want one, um, but checking every box is not going to be the measure of whether you did well in the first hundred days. So, um, you know, as uh, as was once said, plans are useless, but planning is indispensable. Kind of the way I think about that is. Uh, you know, what that says to me is know what's important, drive hard, but be flexible and adapt. So um, we tossed around a couple of topics earlier in the panel, and so it gave me a chance to look back on 100-day plans for three of the boards that I've been on. Um, one of them was one-page of bullets. One of them was one-page table with maybe 12 cells in it. And one was four pages of bullets and several tables. Um, what all of them had in common is none of them hit them fully. And it's never been of concern to the board that they didn't check one or two last boxes on the 100-day plan. And the reason it wasn't important is because uh, of what they did do well, using a 100-day plan as a guide, but being adaptive uh, and flexible. So you know what each of the, the successful searchers turned CEO was doing and is still doing well is learn the business, 
in your first 100 days as best as you can, learn the people, communicate with the clients. You know, clients need to be kept in the loop as to, as to what's going on with one of their, you know, likely major suppliers. And on the less tangible side, you know, walk the walk that you expect others to walk. This is likely very common that it's a cultural change and a change in, even a change in values that you're, that you're looking to instill. Um, on the flip side, looking back at a couple of things that in, in hindsight really were too aggressive in a 100-day plan, in my experience, tend to be too many components of strategy. You know, I think it can be really aggressive to think that as a new CEO, you're going to be able to formulate a clear strategy without living inside the business for at least three months. And, you know, kind of a follow-on to that is since marketing also pretty frequently follows strategy, it's easy to overestimate how much you're going to get done on marketing in the first hundred days. So, you know, my, my overall advice, you know, thinking about the, the, the three CEOs and where they stand today is in the first hundred days, don't overbook yourself, leave time for people, uh, leave time for the unexpected, which you should expect to happen, because um, no matter what your diligence is, you're going to get a curveball. There's going to be some bigger customer issue than you thought there was, uh, an employee issue that you didn't expect, something financial that no matter the diligence, something comes up. Um, you know, and certainly in a software business, you're going to find that no matter what the tech due diligence was, there's still going to be one or two other things that you didn't know about that are just going to be hairier um, than you think. And <laughs> You know, look, there's also plenty of surprises to the positive that come out of the first 100 days, but those don't take time and energy to deal with. You, you celebrate those and you go, yay, does that, but does it really balance out the negatives? No, because those, those take your time and energy to deal with. So just plan for, plan for the surprises as much as you can. Yeah, I, I think that's dead on. We encourage searchers on investments that I'm involved with to be focused on communicating with customers, communicating with their staff, as well as learning the business. You are not, you're gonna have a lot of ideas, a lot of things that came up in diligence, but really your first three to six months should be focused on understanding the business and building out a plan that you can execute. Uh, you don't know what you don't know when you walk in the first day. And so being very mindful of that, that in your first 100 days you're a learner, uh, not a doer. Bill, I guess one thing I would add to that too is so in the deals that we've done over time, um, we always walk in with the management team uh, and create that sort of first thematic goal for the business for that next six months. And it's never achieve uh, an exponential growth in sales, retention, or anything else. It's always one team, one culture, one vision. Um, and that takes six months to a year, to be totally honest, to get everybody retooled to that way of thinking, including you as the CEO, um, if you're the one. So whether it's 90 days, 180 days, or 365 days, it's going to take you a long time to learn the business. Um, and so we've always found that driving toward one team, one vision, unity across, which requires you to communicate and like over-communicate clarity every single day, uh, is really important. And I guess to summarize, one last little piece of that is, um, you know, I love um, Stephen Blank's, you know, startup CEO owner's manual handbook for, I never, I never get the title of the book right, even though I've read it probably 400 times, but <laughs> the startup owner's manual or something, right? Um, anyway, in there, he, he's always done a great job of simplifying everything about building any business. And, you know, think of the first chapter of that book. And what he says is your job is to get, keep, and grow customers. That's it. So when you buy a business and you're planning strategy for that first 100 and 365 days, like how do we get, keep and grow our customers and how do we, and what little things can we do to make incremental improvements while we master the business and master uh, individually what we're really good at so we can then go out and, and drive it a little further and faster. So, so, so let's talk about that. It's a great segue, I think, to a topic that is probably in the minds of everyone in the room. Um, top line growth, right? Driving revenue, improvement in the business from a process, people, systems, I think we keep hearing from the panel is this idea of focus. So when you think about setting goals for growth and how you go about achieving them, um, Keith, would love to maybe start with you. Some of your thoughts about what to pick up first and what to focus on um, as regards driving growth in your business. Yeah, we, we try to keep uh, the, our targets pretty simple in terms of uh, their focus. So for instance, the first company that we acquired um, had a poor website. Uh, didn't do very good marketing, had, um, didn't have any inventory, everything was custom built. So we just 
took that, we moved the production overseas, we uh, had stocked units, uh, we enhanced the website, enhanced the marketing, simple things like that, and so we're able to grow. And then we also had an earnout that kept that you know, owner there helping us and guiding us because we didn't really know what we were doing. We were two bankers trying to be cabinet makers, which is uh, not, not uh, an obvious thing. So um, uh, from there, we, we relied a lot on um, now we're doing SEO and print, and we drop a million books a year, and so all the sort of channels. But uh, um, that was our way of growing the business. So um, you know, from my perspective, uh, Revenue, if, if driving revenue growth means getting new customers, which obviously it, it very commonly does, that's not to say you don't want to get more business from your current customers, but pretty common that you need to go after new customers, then my, my advice is that you've got to deeply understand your capability to onboard new customers. Um, you know, frequently, and meaning three for three in, in my recent experience, um, onboarding a customer can mean sort of an all hands on deck, big scramble, do what it's done, you know, get them on, on board, celebrate, um, and then scramble all over the next time, you know, with very few documented steps in a process, let alone automated steps. Um, and kind of the worst case outcome for that is that, you know, not only do you struggle with your onboardings, but if you don't have a clear process and you're not automating as much of that as you can, especially in a software business, you know, not only are your onboardings at risk, but supporting your current customers are at risk. So, uh, you know, I know a lot of times there's sort of a discussion about um, should, should we focus on operations, should we focus on growth? I mean, from my perspective, the, the, the solid operational foundations, especially for onboarding, is key to being able to successfully onboard a lot of customers without, without crushing yourself. It's a really good point. The way I think about this, having been involved with, what, probably 50 companies, um, is basically you want a list of what are all of your alternatives for growth. You want to narrow that down and make some focused bets and then use the try, evaluate, and then you've got a, a decision point which is, yeah, that's a good opportunity, let's, let's focus on that one, or try again. Um, you're not necessarily going to get it right on your first bet, and that's why having a list of, of options for growth is really important. Just to echo that, I mean, it, when, uh, one of the deals that we did, we sort of walked into closing thinking that we had the right post-close growth strategy already in place. We're like, oh, we got a great team, we got great products, we know how to market this thing. We, we saw some easy and obvious quick wins. In, in this case, it was actually around marketing, for example, as one thing, and uh, an increased focus on a couple of other items. And we thought, oh, this is gonna, this will do it, and we'll get a 25% increase in, in sales, you know, within nine months or so. Not expecting it to be overnight, but going there. And nine months in, we'd had a negative 4% increase in sales, uh, which was awesome. And uh, but and along the way, we could sort of see that that you know that train crashing because it's a slow motion train wreck and every day you wake up going, <laughs> I'm totally wrong, but I don't know what else to do. And so having all these different options sort of laid out day one is a, is a fantastic idea. And then to constantly be iterating and reiterating on those uh, those plans and those those ideals along the way. Because the reality is like you never know exactly what it is that's gonna work, right? And we like to think we do. In hindsight, we all know, right? It was like, well, that was obvious. Of course, that's how we succeeded. But we don't really know beforehand. And when we're in the middle of it, we're, you know, we're, we're trying to figure it out. And so being willing to take these risks and try and fail a lot um, it, while you're integrating the business and understanding the teams and understanding the customers is a huge, hugely important thing. There's a great saying about marketing, which is 50% of all marketing works. The problem is you don't know which 50%. <laughs> The, um, in our investments, we um, often find that I'd say 80, 90 percent of our investments, the most efficient dollars spent on selling are directed toward your existing customers. Now, acquiring new customers is virtually always hard, depending on whatever you know, business you're in, especially long-term customers. But your existing customers have already identified you as a provider of some sort of problem. And so what we find is new owners of businesses, we are the dumbest person in the room uh, including our own management teams, customers, and ourselves, about why our companies have customers in the first place. So we do three things to try to leverage the customer sentiment. The first being, um, in our diligence process, we talk to customers. And the key question in every one of these as regards growth is, why did you choose this company? What other alternatives? And what were your considerations? 
and you start to see these patterns develop and you might go into the deal thinking the company has a particular strength and after you talk to their top 10 customers, you realize actually the market views that very differently. And so it helps you hedge some bets you might have otherwise made and, and put in the wrong spots. Um, the, the next one we focus on is the sales playbook. Um, so if you're ever thinking about hiring sales reps, um, I think many family owned businesses or smaller companies, you know, the truth is the CEO, whatever the, you know, whatever the Excel spreadsheets show, the truth is the, the, the CEO is, is the chief everything officer. And so as you think about how to scale your sales team, or bring new people in the business, um, we spent a lot of time interviewing the CEO, sitting on sales calls, listening to what it is that works for, for that individual, trying to document that. And then as you onboard new folks into sales roles, be able to really provide them with um, kind of the, the, the guts of the value prop and deliver it in a way that has already been proven to work as opposed to trying to come up with that, you know, um, again, as the dumbest guy in the room. And then the, the last one, I think, is um, really uh, more to do with an ongoing kind of post-close activity, but uh, we often find that sort of a win-loss type of program, as you talk to your customers that onboard, you know, make sure that whoever it is that's onboarding that customer or an account manager or just dealing with the customer on an ongoing basis is asking the same question, why, why did you choose us, right? And so that you can continue to hear how your company's strength in the market might change over time. Similarly, depending on your type of business, uh, we find that some of the most Im important insights are for the customers that didn't choose you. So you spend a bunch of time you know, already investing in the sales process and you're not gonna win every one, um, but it shouldn't end there. Uh, properly done win-loss process is reaching back out to that customer, often not the sales rep, but you know, someone else in the organization who is just calling to check in, hey, you know, could I have five minutes of your time? And sometimes you hear things about your weaknesses that you wouldn't otherwise um, be able to know. So um, we find that to be, to be productive as well. So I think the, um, we've got, I think, a couple minutes left of, of, of questions, and then we're going to transition to the crowd. So uh, maybe just one more for the group as we do a quick, quick run through. Um, if we could just maybe we start at this end of the table with you, Jeremy. Um, biggest lesson learned. So lots of experiences, right? Um, probably a lot of wisdom across the panel to transmit. But if you were to try to think about all these stories and experiences, you know, most important kind of lesson that, that you'd impart to the group? There are so many. Um, <laughs> wow. So the, the, I think humility is key, forever and always. Uh, humility and gratitude. So gratitude for the opportunity you have to take this business and work with the existing staff and the new staff you bring along and try to drive it forward. Um, and uh, keeping that front and center for yourself as the new CEO, I think, is, is, is such a valuable thing to bring to the table every single day. And then the humility to realize, day in and day out, certainly for the first, I don't know if it's, depending on the business, three months, six months, a year, maybe more, that you are the dumbest guy or gal in the room, that you will be for a long time. And the humility to be okay with that, um, I think, is absolutely essential to avoiding a bunch of the mistakes that you could otherwise make. Um, and I could elaborate for an hour, so I won't, but humility and gratitude are the two things I think you absolutely have to have every day um, when you're trying to do this, and not having those leads to colossal, catastrophic failure and death. <laughs> I, I can't agree with Jeremy more that that really is key, and I, I learned that lesson firsthand in the septic business, and I learned that the guy who drives the truck that makes nine fifty an hour wants exactly what I want, a decent job, opportunity, the ability to take care of their family. The only difference, mine's got more zeros on it. So I think that goes to the humility piece. I'm gonna leave you with, with one thing. All of you are really smart and you build fantastic models, but one of the original founders of the search fund business in a board meeting said this to me, Irv Grossbeck, which many of you may have heard of, uh, he's kind of the granddaddy of the whole search process. He said, it's really easy to make money in Excel, and it's really hard in the real world. So I would encourage you to, to get out of your models and get into the business. And once you've bought a business, don't worry about your model. It's really easy mm -hmm. to make money in Excel, but not so much in real life. Totally true. Mm -hmm. So, love that. So. Yeah. Um, so as, as a software guy, of course, I want to share like software thoughts on, on mistakes and learnings, et cetera. But 
you know, this conversation really reminds me, it's, even if it's a software business, it's still about people. So thinking about a couple of experiences over the last couple of years um, with search and new CEOs, my, my advice and my big lesson learned and some things I wish we did better were um, drive out toxic employees uh, more aggressively. Um, and what I mean by to uh, toxic is uh, they don't align with the company values. They're either actively or passively undermining you. Um, it's even more important to, to push on this the higher up the person is in the company. They're going to be a drag on your time and energy. Don't fall into the trap of thinking that they're too valuable to the company to let go because of their history or experience. There's no single person who's worth so much that the toxicity outweighs the, the downside to the rest of the team. So again, that's easy to look at. In hindsight, it's harder to recognize at a given point in time, especially when you're still new and you're nervous that I don't know the business well enough. You know, just kind of ask yourself, when are you ever going to feel that way? And then, you know, evaluate the toxic person in that, uh, in that light and, and take action. Um, I have six things down. I think I've covered, <laughs> covered three of them already. The integrity of the seller, um, turning a business around uh, can, can be a lot harder than you think uh, in a robust software uh, platform. But the other three I had were uh, we derive about 70% um, of our revenues from manufacturing, and only in the last three years have I employed lean manufacturing, which is a um, derivative from Japan in production and, and has been uh, phenomenally uh, in, impactful for what we do. I wish we'd done it 10 years ago. Um, I joined EO as well, which is an entrepreneur organization, which, uh, you know, if you're, if you're running a company and you're working with a lot of folks that are um, hourly wage earners. It's nice to have uh, someone else to bounce ideas off of in the professional community. And this is all a bunch of like-minded entrepreneurs as well. Uh, and then on the last one, don't give up equity to partners that aren't going to be significant contributors. I've been pretty fortunate to have two partners that were able to contribute in various roles that, that I wasn't really good at. But um, if you think that you can just hire that skill, then that's de definitely better than giving up equity just to get another body on board. Outstanding. Um, I guess the, the aphorism I'll kind of close with is we, we talk about this a lot. Just the simple phrase, you know, 90% um, of strategy is, is saying no. So particularly when you find yourself in a resource constrained environment, um, over intellectualizing all the great stuff you're going to do is you know, it goes as far as the spreadsheet, but I think when it gets down to it, you've got limited time, limited resources, it's really saying no to the things that don't have you jumping out of your seat um, as, you're, as you evaluate new initiatives. And uh, doing that can help you focus on the, on the bets that you really want to make. So with that, uh, we'll open it up for, for questions from the room. So for those who can't hear, the question uh, is in regard to due diligence. It can be grueling for the employees of the company you're evaluating. Um, what's kind of the right way to get the, the answers you, you want? It's more like trying to follow that up with a 100-day plan. Okay, so layered in the 100-day plan on, on the back of, of your diligence. Well, I'll, I'll jump in. You know, your 100-day plan is really about learning about the business. Uh, and so that means interacting with the employees, looking at things, and I think you're going to have to make an assessment about what the right touch is with the employees, how much is too much, uh, and this is your introduction to them. So I, I wouldn't think that your 100-day plan would be really data intensive. Uh, it would be kind of a high-level assessment of what the data is and starting to get a few things in, but I think that's your, that's your primary focus, which is to learn the business, develop relationships with the employees. So it's not that same process as a due diligence process, which typically feels pretty invasive. I would just say that usually the due diligence process is the thing that informs that 100-day plan. 
So you're kind of building the 100-day plan through the diligence process because you're also figuring out what's working, what's not, where can I add value, where can my other resources add value. And to Mike's point, I think one of the biggest things that you can do through that diligence and then the 100-day the planning process is come up with that one thing, not 100 things, but the one thing that's going to be most important to, to accomplish during that phase that gets the team, the whole company, a big win. Um, so it doesn't necessarily need to be the planning part doesn't have to be as invasive as the diligence part. Yeah, I, I, I think that's right. So to, to give a specific example from the tech side, you know, let, let's say your tech diligence um, reveals that significant parts of the, uh, of the system are built in older languages that aren't supported anymore. It's gonna be difficult to hire people with that, with that kind of skill. Your 100-day plan is not gonna say fix that, right? It's gonna be, Break it down into three things that you want to dig into a little bit more, and then, you know, from a soft skills perspective, you, you've got to make sure that you're digging into things without putting people on the on the defensive, because um, there are plenty of good reasons why whatever the issue is is the issue, and you're not there to judge that and put people on the defensive. You're there to uh, to work with them as part of creating the solution, and so a hundred day plan. You know, again, from a board level, you just kind of want to see that each of those is a topic and a, to a, a focus of your time and energy, not that any solution to it's going to be expected in, in three months. On this last acquisition, we um, were fortunate enough to be able to interview all the key people in the company, which doesn't necessarily always happen, but because um, going into that, you're like, well, I'm not so sure about it, but then when you get to talk to everybody behind closed doors, the picture becomes a lot more clear. So it may seem a little bit daunting at first, but once you, once you start having those kind of conversations, and then you're also you know, asking them to interview for their job, right? So that, that gives you a lot of clarity on the plan you're gonna roll out once you acquire. So the question is, how much of your due diligence do you do yourself versus outsourcing to consultants? Uh, my experience is that it kind of depends on the size of the organization that you're buying. Um, some businesses are easier to diligence with yourself and or your, your deal team. Um, I would hope it would never just, particularly, I would hope it would never be a CEO that doesn't have experience doing it before. That would be a huge mistake. Um, but uh, if it's your first time, again, depending on the size of the company, it's probably you, the CEO, and somebody or bodies, preferably bodies, from your um, search fund group or a tight support network to help you work through that because you're not the expert in all those things, right? So you'll need support and help. The bigger the business, the more likely you are to bring in a third-party um, consultant to help you, again, with specific parts of the business that you just don't have any expertise in. Typically, you're going to have, if you're working with one of the traditional search fund investors, they're going to want a Q of E, which is a quality of earnings. Mm -hmm. And that you would typically outsource to an accounting firm at a fixed fee that you can manage. Uh, and then you would allow them to do the bulk of that. I think you know a lot of the, soft, um, the softer areas, sales, marketing, um, operations, depending on the nature of the company, you're going to want to be intimately involved in because that's where you're going to get the most information about key elements of the business. So I think if you think about, you can always outsource the financial stuff. You review the report, you, you deal with that. But it's really the other stuff that I think you're going to want to be very, very focused on. And if you need to bring in an outside expert for a particular thing, then you'll do that. So uh, one specific example is uh, tech due diligence. So you know it's uh, it, it, it's it's obvious when you are a software business. I mean, if you're providing software to your customers, you're a software business. But um, what a lot of people don't realize or appreciate, I think, is that if the end service that you're providing isn't software, but there's proprietary software that's still key to providing that business service, then welcome to being a software business. So um, having tech diligence, which is absolutely something I would you know, recommend outsourcing. There are a lot of great firms that do a wonderful job. Um, if, you are, you know, if you're a new searcher, but you have an engineering background and you've been a software engineer, still hire somebody because um, they, they know how to do it up, down, and sideways. That's really good advice, thank you. Uh, we just do all our own. All, all our own work. Um, I think I've spent $10,000 on four or five transactions on legal fees. 
um, just trying to get a, maybe a handle on a contingent liability or something, but we write our own uh, agreements and, and do all our own due diligence. Yeah, um, I have strong views on this one myself, so I'll, I'll chime in. I think um, <laughs> as regarding consultants, uh, a consultant you've never worked with before is just like a business you've never owned. You don't know the first thing about how good they are. So there's a temptation to, especially in areas where you're weak, to lean on the supposed expert. I would challenge you, especially in those types of situations, to avoid framing the problem for your consultant and letting them decide a bad consultant will just repeat back some gist of what you've told them um, or identify opportunities for them to solve post-close uh, generating more fees. So I think that you need to be very careful the consultants that choose. Um, and if you're in an area where you haven't dealt with somebody before or you don't know the very narrow scope of work you're asking them to do, um, you know, tap your network, ask for referrals, um, always a much better way to go than, uh, than dealing with folks who um, you know, may be stronger than you but not strong enough. How, what's the best, well there we go, what's the best way to go about assessing the integrity of the seller or finding out the reputation of the seller because it's probably, yeah. maybe it's only one time they're doing it so how, how would you, what's the best way to do that? Yeah, um, the market we were in is pretty scrappy, so you got a lot of types of folks that were, um, you know, do anything it takes to, to get deals done and, and business done. So if you ask around in the market, everybody, we are, we're in a fairly small niche, so it, it was, you ask two, two different people and you can triangulate, or three, you can triangulate pretty quickly on, on who's sketchy and who's, you know, who's got a great reputation. The guy that we bought from our first company, Great. He was a terrible marketer, great, you know, builder, and, and had, but people loved him in terms of working with him and a lot of integrity. So that made me not have to, you know, go through all his books and get too nervous about the transaction. That's right. The, the his, I mean, if, you, if you're fortunate enough, you can ask his vendors, you know, and his customers. Probably he's not going to give you free, or she's not going to give you free reign on that, but um, it, it it, it's a pretty, after, after a while you get a good gut feel and, uh, on that sniff test and you can say, yeah, this is, this is somebody. Cause, and if you've also, if you've got an earn out with them, they're going to be your partner for the next couple of years, right? So uh, that's, that's a good way to make sure they're aligned with you. Time for probably two more, I think. Mike, you mentioned talking to customers during dil diligence. How do you go about getting permission to do that? So I'll defer to the group um, on this one. We invest in a different stage than a lot of the folks in, in perhaps the room. Yeah, I'd say very quickly, for, at least for ourselves, in the smaller deals where it's more challenging, um, you know, I think if you can speak to, a simple way to do it is to just put a script on the table, have them approve the script, and then stick to the script and let them on the calls or meetings. Um, introduce yourself at the beginning as a consultant to the business. Hey, I'm trying to help Joe, the CEO, who you already know, you know, improve customer experience, um, you know, potentially, you know, help invest and back the business and, and make, you know, uh, better product services, right? So you start with that, and I think you can really, you know, desensitize to everybody. Um, and, and then I encourage you, too. I mean, you, you need to stick to that script, right? You, you can't start um, putting the, the trust of the customer at risk. But. Uh, I guess I would say what you just described is exactly what we do. So um, are you, who in here is familiar with Voice of the Customer? Some people, a few, yeah. So uh, VOC or Voice of the Customer is a super valuable exercise that I think every business should, should employ with some sort of regularity, but um, it's this exact thing. Generally, you hire a third party, they come in and they do a whole series of, really think of them as surveys, outbound outreach to your customer base to sort of get a third party's perspective and you and direct feedback from your customers on what you do well, but you don't do well, all that kind of stuff. So we generally set our uh, customer interviews up with a VOC um, moniker and a VOC front, although we're very open and honest about the fact that, hey, we're, we're consulting with the firm, we may be involved in a business capacity with them at some point, but we're here to help them figure out ways to service you better and understand your relationship with them. Um, because uh, then if you're doing that and you're open, you're honest, you don't, you're not saying, hey, we've got an LOI in place, we're going to buy these guys, so tell us all the dirt. But if you're saying we're a partner, we're working with them, we're here to help them, help you get more value, then you can generally get a lot of their biggest and best customers uh, to be very open and honest with you, again, per a script, to give you a lot of information about, uh, about what you might want to know about their relationships. 
I think we've had a couple of instances where you're acquiring contracts for recurring revenue businesses. Those get a little trickier. A lot of them have assignability requirements. Uh, so what we've typically done in those circumstances, especially when the seller does not want us to talk to them or even divulge who they are oftentimes, they'll identify them as customer one, two, three, four, and the way you proceed is that's the last piece of diligence you do. That is not the preferred way because you really want to get at the customer pieces as soon as you can. But if you've got you know something that's unusual or they're very touchy about it, also if they're very touchy, that's a sign that you ought to be very careful when you talk to the customers and know exactly what you're looking, what questions am I trying to get answered when I talk to the customers? It's really easy to have a happy chat conversation with a customer, but really figure out what is it that I want to know about this customer that'll be helpful to me. There's, um, there's an exercise we do, it's kind of a secret shopper exercise is, is the idea. So presumably if you're looking at acquiring a company, you know at least one potential customer for that business. If you don't know any potential customers for your company you're going to buy, you probably have other, <laughs> other issues. But Presumably, you can identify somebody that would benefit from the products or services of the company you want to buy and is not yet a customer. And so in this situation, what you, uh, you can do is make contact with the potential customer or a few and have them go through the sales process with uh, the company you're, you're evaluating. And you can get direct feedback from potential customers on how they interact, how they stack up, et cetera. So also, one way to get at it if the existing customers can become you know, a challenge or, or tough to crack into. I think we have time for maybe maybe one one last question. I think there's somebody in the back. That's, there you go. So once you basically took, you heard right, Mike. Okay, so the, the question more or less is once you've done the diligence, you've done the deal, you're humble about, about having finished it and you're working your way through, uh, how do you sort of figure out the, the time, like how much time it could or could not take you, right, to affect the changes or major change that you're looking to affect? Is that a fair restatement? Yeah. So it's a timing thing. What's, how do we think about timing? I can just speak to... Uh, uh, recently, it took us about six or seven months to realize how hard this acquisition was going to be, and um, we had laid off uh, about five of the 13 t team members, then realized we need to lay off even more because this business was not going to turn around that fast. So it took us about fully nine months to kind of get to grips with the business and right-size it and, you know, start the marketing and intensive plan to start taking it back up again in terms of outbound calls and, and revitalizing the customer base. I mean, we've had deals. If you're talking in terms of month or adding a year to the life cycle, the key is do the right thing and spend less time worrying about time because your investment returns for your investors are not going to be overly influenced by an additional one year on the exit. Focus on doing the right thing and just be transparent about what you found and why you're shifting. But the difference between a five-year exit and a six-year exit really isn't going to impact returns that much. Yeah. yeah. Be patient. Just, it's going to take you way longer than you expect to do everything you want to do. Yeah. Um, you just have to be patient and let it, and let it happen while you're, you're pushing and poking and prodding it along. But um, patience is key. Great. Well, uh, I think that concludes the formal session. Um, I think some folks have some extra time. We'll be hanging out up at the stage, but thanks very much.